Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. So, all right. Um, thank you, Jim, for the introduction. Um, so, as Jim said, I'm Alvaro Munoz, also known as Pond Tester in uh, social network, tw uh, Twitter, GitHub, and so on. I work as a principal security researcher with Fortify team. I mainly do uh, static analysis related research. And um, probably, well, I focus on, on web application security, right? Uh, what I find more interesting is getting remote code execution on, on web applications. And I have responsibly uh, reported uh, critical remote code execution vulnerabilities to companies like Microsoft, Oracle, um, Workday, Salesforce, and so on. Um, so one of them uh, in Microsoft I will be sharing with you today, hopefully, if we have time. So apart from that, I have some experience around deserialization. I started not in 2015 when, uh, as uh, Jim said, but actually in 2012, playing with uh, XML decoder and XStream, trying to get remote code execution uh, in RESTful web services, right? Um, so we were able to get remote code execution in some libraries like RESTlet and RESTEC. And then I moved into the binary format of uh, Java deserialization, right? And I found, uh, to, what I, to my knowledge, is the first uh, remote code execution gadget uh, for Java deserialization, but for the binary format, back in 2013. And it was not in Apache Commons collection, but actually in the Spring uh, libraries, right? So unfortunately, uh, this uh, gadget didn't become as popular as the Apache Commons collection gadget um, became. And I'm saying, unfortunately, because uh, we all saw that this was like a tipping point, right? And when um, Christopher Hope and Gabriel Lawrence found this gadget, the community started looking for these vulnerabilities. They started fixing them and so on. So we could have saved ourselves like a couple of years by starting back in 2013 or even, even before. So at this point in 2015, Christopher Hope and Gabriel Lawrence uh, published the Apache Commons Collection gadget, and everything changes, right? All the researchers start looking into Java deserialization. They start publishing vulnerabilities like in WebLogic, uh, WebSphere, and many other applications. So I retook my interest in Java deserialization. I, I found like um, a technique to bypass what is known as the look-ahead object deserialization. That is like the standard mitigation technique for uh, this kind of attacks in Java. And also I found like multiple gadgets uh, to lead into remote code execution, including one in the Java runtime itself. So not requiring any uh, third party libraries in order to work. So then I uh, switched gears and I started looking into JSON to close the circle, right? So from XML to binary and then to JSON. And I published uh, some approaches to get remote code execution in JSON deserializers back in last year in, in Black Hat and, and, and DEF CON. So most of this is Java, right? And this is what is known as the Java deserialization apocalypse. Um, and I think, well, it, it's bad because, I mean, there was many applications that were affected by these bugs. But in the other hand, it was good because we got uh, this category all together to go into the OWASP uh, top 10, right? And we, as a security community, we have knowledge about the latest uh, trends and latest categories like, I don't know, SPL injection or JNDI injection, but developers, don't normally have this visibility in what um, vulnerabilities they should focus on. And I think that having a secure deserialization in the OWAS top 10 is a good thing in order for developers to start looking and fixing these vulnerabilities. So um, at that point, I decided to take a look into .NET because, well, I'm not a .NET developer, I'm not a .NET researcher, but since I had some previous experience with uh, deserialization, I decided to take a look because Apparently, there was a previous research around .NET deserialization, but there was no remote code execution gadget. And as happened with um, Java before, it was not until a remote code execution gadget was published that the community started fixing and taking care of this vulnerability. So I decided to look for one in order to start you know, the ball moving. So what I'm going to present today is the result of this uh, research. Um, so I will first introduce a brief introduction into serialization. Then we will be reviewing what are the most common uh, .NET serializers and formatters. And then we will move to the more like builder and defender part of the talk that is finding vulnerabilities and fixing them. All right, so um, Marshall in Pickles. I will be using Rick and Morty picture because why not? So this is Rick, uh, right? He's uh, an instance, uh, an object living in the uh, VM. And at some point, the developer want to take Rick out of the VM, right? So he wants to put it in the file system or into uh, the database or send it across the network. So he put uh, Rick 
across the magic portal, and then he gets a pickle rig. <laughs> so at a later stage, um, we want to recover the object back in the VM, so we will put pickle rig back into the ma magic portal and then recover and reconstruct rig again. All right, so there is one thing in this slide that is critical for these deserialization attacks to work. So anyone? Something that is like the design flow of all these formats, like dev? So say that again, sorry. Yeah, well, this is just a very simplification, a simplified model of the deserialization. But the, the issue I was uh, referring to is that we are not sending just the, the pickle itself, but we are sending a pickle rig as long, a lo um, with the uh, serialized data as well. So um, this is what is known as the type discriminator. And basically, if you are familiar with Java deserialization, uh, even though it's a binary format, you will find like class names or type names in the, in the serialized data. Same thing with .NET, for example. This is JSON.NET. Um, you will find some dollar attributes, uh, dollar type attributes containing something that looks like um, .NET type uh, and .NET assembly names. So if the attacker can control the type discriminator and they change pickle rig with a pickle morty, then the server will blindly trust that and then will instantiate an instance of morty instead of the, of the rig one, right? So there is probably nothing really dangerous here because uh, they are going to invoke the default constructor of this um, Morty class, which is, uh, it takes no parameters, so there is nothing where the attacker can modify the behavior of this and, and just get arbitrary code execution. However, apart from the default constructor, there will be other methods that will get invoked, like for example, in Java we'll get the uh, read object and read resolve methods. Uh, and in .NET, the same thing, we have like this uh, deserialization constructor over here, uh, deserialization callbacks, even some annotations that we can use to annotate methods that are going to be invoked by the framework in order to fully reconstruct the object, right? Uh, same thing with uh, XML and JSON. Um, the, these libraries will normally just invoke the default constructor and then invoke setters in order to populate the data in the class types. And we, they will be invoking setters in order to do that. All right, so. All that the attackers need to do is find a gadget, right? And a gadget is nothing else than a type or a class that is sitting in the uh, target application class path. So they cannot provide the implementation for the, for the type. They can only provide the type name. And since they can control the values for these uh, properties of this class, then they are able to actually modify the behavior of the methods that are going to, invoke, to be invoked, like, for example, the visualization um, callbacks or the setters. So this is more like a builder and defender talk, and I'm not going to focus on how to find and, and yeah, well, find gadgets leading to remote code execution, but I think it's good to show you an example of a very simple one leading to remote code execution, so you can have like an idea of how they look like. So this is a system um, Windows data, object data provider. It's a type uh, in the Windows GAG, so it's available without any third party uh, dependencies uh, required. And it contains three different setters, right, that will initiate um, some invocations that will end up invoking this method over here. And here we are basically just uh, using reflection to invoke a method name on an object instance passing some parameters, right? And those are exactly the ones that we can control uh, see if we can control the values that are passed to the setters, right? So if an attacker provides a piece of JSON.NET data, like this one, to a vulnerable endpoint, the vulnerable endpoint will basically instantiate the object data provider, and they, it will invoke the setters for the object instance, for the method parameters, and for the method name. And as we saw before, this will initiate these uh, this calls here, and will end up invoking the reflection and getting, the, um, in this case, the calculator to pop up. Right, so I'm not going to talk more about gadgets. If you want to check which gadgets are available for Java, uh, visit the YSUCDL project. If you want to know more about um, gadgets in .NET, 
I grow this project that is called whysocial.net that basically it can be used to generate um, payloads and gadgets for um, different formats in the .NET family. So this is a simple example. For example, just invoke it like the one that we just saw. Um, if you want to attack JSON.NET, uh, just specify the format there, specify the gadget, specify the command, and it will generate the payload for you to use in your penetration test and POCs and so on. So with that, let's move into uh, reviewing what formatters and serializers are vulnerable in the .NET family. So uh, as I said, this is nothing new. Uh, back in 2012, uh, James Forso from the Google Project Zero was already presenting on how um, passing untrusted data to a binary formatter or net data contract serializers could lead into some malicious code being run. At that time, there was no remote code execution gadget, and I think that he only presented a gadget that was able to delete files from the file system or initiate some uh, SMB uh, relay attacks. Right, so as happened with Java before, since there, was, since there were no remote code execution gadgets, no one paid really um, you know, attention to these vulnerabilities, and there were like many, many vulnerabilities uh, related with .NET deserialization until, until last year, probably. So last year, in 2017, my colleague Alexander Miros and myself, we found a remote code execution gadget in .NET, and that was followed by James Forso presenting two more, so there are like a number of them right now. So um, as we said, uh, James presented a couple of uh, formatters that are vulnerable in their default configuration. Those are binary formatter and net data contract serializer, but there are more, right? These are the ones, like I said, that are vulnerable in their default configuration. They should never be used with untrusted data, at least in this default configuration. And they include uh, the binary formatter one, that is the one that James presented, but this one is also used internally by other serializers, right? For example, uh, this binary message format that is used by the Microsoft message queue system, so if you can send them arbitrary types, you will be able to get arbitrary code execution. Uh, same thing uh, with the object state formatter, that is used by the ASP.NET view state, so if you can change the view state and survive the HMAC verification, that will also lead to remote code execution, and we will see more about this later. So then we have more like sub format that is using web services, fast JSON, sweet JSON. Those are like third party libraries. So the most popular and used one is the binary formatter. And this is probably the most common anti pattern that I found. I uh, literally found like thousands of applications in Shodan uh, vulnerable to remote code execution because they were using exactly this pattern. And this is basic, well, this is very simple. Uh, they are uh, basically instantiating the binary formatter and then serializing some data, base64 encoding that data and putting that into a cookie. So um, if that cookie comes back, the server is going to deserialize that and since there is no HMAC verification, it will go in and run arbitrary commands using these gadgets. So the first time that I found that was in App Harbor. Anyone knows App Harbor? Yeah, I know you use it. <laughs> So, uh, well, browsing the site, I realized that they were setting this cookie with this AAE, AAAD, that is nothing else than the magic number for the binary formatter and then base64 encoded. So that means that this uh, site, that is basically like Heroku for, for .NET applications, like to uh, host .NET applications, uh, was vulnerable to remote code execution. We reported that, and they fixed it. But then we realized that they even had a blog post explaining how to do exactly what they were doing. So instead of keeping some objects in the server side, just save some uh, memory and put them in the client side by serializing them and putting them into a cookie. So we tell them about this blog post and they uh, now deleted this, this blog post. However, uh, this same advice is everywhere. Um, you can find like multiple uh, GIST and blog posts and even in Microsoft ASP.NET MVC framework was using the very same approach that they silently removed back in 2013, right? And this is related with uh, what Jeremy was talking before, like if they don't publish like a CV, you, are, you don't know that uh, there is something that you should update uh, and so on. Like, this is kind of important. So uh, let's see a demo. This is a vulnerability that I found in Azure. Um, yeah, so this is from last year. So as you can see, even though this uh, research by James Forsyth was published in 2012. There were many um, developers 
even Microsoft developers using uh, binary formatter with untrusted data. So if you're familiar with Azure Active Directory um, or application proxy, you basically have your intranet here and you have your uh, web application that you want to, to share, right? To, to expose to your remote employees. So your employees will basically connect to the application proxy, then will be redirected to the Azure Active Directory where they will be like, ask for the credentials that will be checked against your own instance of the Active, Active Directory and then they will be returning a token and then authenticating against the application proxy. I think that is very, better explained with a video. So this is, uh, we're visiting a application that I'm exposing through this um, Azure uh, application proxy and I'm redirected to the um, Microsoft single sign-on, right? I don't even need to log in into Azure because this is a pre-authentication remote code execution. So I will basically send the request through Burp or any proxy. And well, basically I will just um, send this request to the repeater so we can see what is going on. And as you can see here, we get a 302 redirection to the single sign-on page in Microsoft, and then we get this cookie assigned here, right? If you recognize this magic number, the same one in App Harbor, this basically means remote code execution. So we just uh, get, what we have to do now is generate our, uh, our payload, and we will be basically um, this was before I wrote the whysocial.net, so I had to do it by hand. But basically, I will be doing a DNS resolution against my own DNS server, and I will be leaking the computer name just to prove that the remote code execution was not in my own um, intranet servers, but actually in Azure servers. So with that, I will just generate the payload. Uh, during the process of, generation, of generating the payload, the payload will get executed, so I will get a connection back to my DNS server from my own VM, as you can see here. So that's my VM uh, computer name, so nothing interesting so far. But now, if we copy paste the payload generated by our gadget or payload generator into the cookie, and we send this request to Microsoft, um, or to Azure Network, we will see that we will get some connection back from uh, different servers, actually, not just one. So for example, the first one is from uh, this server down here, that is Microsoft servers, and then if I submit the request again, I will get a different connection, which means that uh, I can compromise all the application proxies that are working like in a load balanced way, which means that I can intercept any traffic going to any intranet of customers using uh, this Azure thing. So that was pretty bad. Uh, the good thing is that Microsoft only had to patch them, their own system and that was quite easy and they did it uh, very quickly. All right, so apart from those um, deserializers that are vulnerable in their default configuration, uh, there are other uh, serializers that are known as template deserializers that work with an expected type, right? So if you want to deserialize something, they will only work with one type, right? For example, if you're expecting a shopping cart instance, then you cannot send like an object data provider um, payload because that won't work, right? So those examples, uh, examples of that is, for example, the data contract serializer, the data contract JSON serializer, and the XML ser uh, serializer. So in these cases, they are still vulnerable, but the attacker needs to control not just the data that is going to be deserialized, but also the suspected type. You may think that this is not very common, but I found that, for example, one good example in .NET Nuke, that is the most popular content management system in, in .NET, and basically at some point they were taking the contents of a cookie that was not signed, and they, that was like an XML cookie, I don't know why, but anyway, they were extracting some type name from this XML, and then they were um, invoking the constructor of the XML serializer with this data that can be controlled by the attacker. So now the attacker can control the expected type, and then it was, uh, it was um, extracting the rest of the XML and then deserializing that. So 
now the attacker can control the expected type and the data being deserialized, which means that the attacker can control the whole object graph and run a arbitrary code in the server. So that was reported and was fixed. Okay, so the third group is those serializers that are vulnerable in some specific configuration, right? So those are, for example, JavaScript serializer, that is the native Microsoft uh, don't, uh, JSON deserializer, and JSON.NET, that is the third party one that is even more popular than the Microsoft one. So let's see the first one, this is JavaScript serializer. JavaScript serializer is safe to be used with untrusted data as long as you don't do this. That is basically passing a type resolver. If you use a type resolver, that means that it's going to include the type information along the, with the JSON data, and then it's going to process that um, type information, so it's going to allow the attackers to, ar to instantiate arbitrary types and invoke these setters that will lead to arbitrary code execution. Same thing with JSON.NET. Uh, but instead of an argument to the, um, to the constructor, in this case it's a property, right? And they are setting this type name handling, which means that it will include and process the type information uh, in the JSON data. So you have to set known, because if you set objects, uh, arrays, or auto, then uh, the framework will be including this information, and it will make the, the endpoint vulnerable. All right, so how about finding if your applications are vulnerable? So there are like different approaches. Uh, the first one, probably the most simple one, is to inspect the traffic flowing in and out of your applications and look for magic numbers or these um, signatures of the traffic being uh, serialized data. As we saw before, this AAE, AAAD is uh, an example of this. This is the base64 format for the magic number of the binary formatter but there are other um, magic numbers, like for example, for the object state formatter or for the uh, XML serializer, and there are other encoding. So I wrote this simple ver uh, plugin that you can freely use, and basically we'll, use, uh, we'll check for these uh, magic, num magic numbers in different encodings. So, um, well, I didn't meant to be like a perfect, very accurate plugin, so it will have some uh, false positives, like for example, if this magic number is found in, in some images that will be reported, and also it might find that you are sending uh, serialized data, but it's not checking if there is a signature for that serialized data. So maybe uh, you cannot exploit it. It's not a false positive because there is serialized data, but it's not exploitable. So we will see more about the view state later. So the second approach is an active approach where you are basically sending a payload and watching if that payload gets executed and trying to recognize out of band if that gets executed. So example of this is like, for example, making the server sleep for a number of seconds and then check if the response gets delayed. Or for example, like I did with Azure, you can run a DNS uh, lookup in order to, if you control the DNS server, to check if um, the payload is being executed. Um, I asked is another approach. Um, I don't know if it's passive, active, or something in the middle, but I consider it active because you, can, you have to actually instrument uh, your uh, virtual machines, right? So you instrument the virtual machines, you monitor what is going on inside of the virtual machine, and then if some untrusted data gets into this deserialized method, then we will report that. That's good for pre-production, uh, but not for production. Anyway, if you have access to the source code, that's probably the easiest approach. Just check if some untainted data, some untrusted data, flows into one of these deserialized uh, things. If you do that, you have to consider that it's not a simple, well, for some formatters, like binary formatted, it's very simple. For, for some other uh, formatters, such as XML serializer, you have to correlate different data flows and also take in, um, control flow into account because there can be a serialization binder that we will see later. Uh, so you have to consider that. But this is something that most uh, of the static analysis tool can do. So uh, if you use Fortify, I know it works because I wrote the support for that, so you are safe. <laughs> um, also, uh, fixing vulnerable endpoints, right? So now you find that your, you found that your application is vulnerable. Sorry. So how can you fix it, right? So the first approach is, do you really need to serialize that data? And this seems silly, but I found like many applications that were using serialization for strings, right? And w uh, one good case for, for this, uh, one good example, is the Nancy web application framework. Uh, 
Uh, the Nancy is basically a web application framework that is very similar to Sinatra framework in, in Ruby. And they care about security and they implemented CSRF protection, but instead of putting a unique token into the CSRF uh, cookie, they were serializing that token into binary format serialized data and then putting that into the cookie. So making the uh, whole framework and then all the applications built using this framework vulnerable to remote code execution because of uh, this implementation of the CSRF protection. Uh, same thing with uh, type discriminators. Um, JSON and XML is okay to, to use, but you should not use, it with, use them with um, type information, right? So that was the case of the Breeze framework. Uh, Breeze is a .NET um, entity management framework. They basically expose, it's very similar to Spring Data REST, so they expose some database entities uh, through our RESTful um, web service automatically. And they were sending the type information to the JavaScript client. So that made no sense because uh, JavaScript is not going to understand the .NET type, so they were not using that. So because of this uh, mistake, the whole framework was vulnerable to remote code execution. And they fixed it very quickly in a matter of hours uh, by just setting this uh, type name handling setting to known, right? So this is actually the default value. So probably at some point they were playing with that and they changed that and they remain in the code. So I think it's a good idea to explicitly set these uh, secure values explicitly and then even add a comment like do not change this, please. <laughs> So, um, okay, what, what if you really need to serialize data? So the first case was when you were serializing a string, so that was not required. Uh, now, if you have some object graph that you want to persist in the client side, for example, for performance reasons or whatever reasons, then uh, if you are not expecting the client to modify that data, then sign it and verify that the data hasn't been modified, right? If you do that, always use an HMAC and never use uh, something like MD5 or SHA-1 with secret and data because that's vulnerable to has length ex um, extension attacks. And this is the way that App Harbor and Azure actually fix their issues. Um, they just sign the, the data that they were not expecting anyone to, to change, and then they verify that that change didn't um, get modified. Same thing with ASP.NET. If you remember, back in 2013, they removed this cookie temp data provider and they replaced it with something else. And that was uh, basically the same approach of serializing server-side data into the client side. But this time, they were using the Data Protector API. Right? They were doing something very similar to this, called the Data Protector API Protect the Bytes, and that will basically uh, sign and encrypt the data using the web config validation and encryption uh, keys, and then uh, this data won't be able to be tampered with without the server side noticing. So another good example of signing and verifying di um, the data is the ASP.NET view state, right? So for those of you that are not familiar with the view state, it's like a representation of the state of a page. So the server is going to send you the state of the page to you as a hidden uh, field, uh, for, uh, form field, and then when you submit the form back, you are submitting the previous state so the server can reconstruct the previous state and then continue from there. So this is used by ASP.NET. And I think that in the beginning, uh, they were not even forcing or they were not um, signing and encrypting the view state. So the problem back in, the, in these days was that if there was some sensitive data, for example, in the view state, then the clients were going to be able to extract and leak that data. Also, if the client was able to modify the data because it was not, it was not signed, uh, then they could change the application logic. So that was back in, in the good days, like many years ago. And at some point in version 4.5.2, Microsoft even started ignoring the enable view state Mac meaning that even if you set that to false, they will always encrypt and sign your view state, which is good, and they even backported that back to 1.1. So I was curious, and I ran a shutdown query, and I found that uh, more than 200 servers are still running vulnerable versions that are not using uh, any signature or encryption in the view state, which makes like a good uh, cryptocurrency botnet or something like that, 
Anyway, um, at some point, uh, they improved the cryptographic posture of the view state by actually using a key derivation function. And this was a very interesting approach because uh, if the attacker is able to leak the validation and encryption key, then they will be able to actually change the encryption and change, uh, well, not change the encryption, but changing the view state and then putting the payload there and get arbitrary code execution. So uh, what they did is that they generate some per request uh, unique strings that they call purposes. And what they do is that they run this through a key DF, a key derivation function, in order to generate some keys that are unique for each request. Now, if the attacker is able to leak this encryption and validation keys, uh, those keys won't be able to tamper and modify the view state because the ones that will be used are these ones over here, right? So I just, you know, connected a debugger and took a look, and I visit the account register page, and then I check the values for these uh, purposes uh, strings. So the first one is primary purpose, right? And this one is always going to be the same, is this string over here with the client state, if it's for the view state, other values for other things. And then you have the specific purposes, right? So the first one is a template source directory slash account. The second one is the account register ASPX. So both of them quite predictable for an attacker, right? The third one looks like pretty random uh, generated, like this 776 EC whatever value that looks like arbitrary value. However, this is the same value that is used in your anti cross site request forgery token um, cookie, right? So the attacker is going to be able to read that and is going to be able to um, generate all these strings and therefore if they are able to leak this case, then they will be able to generate those keys, right? So now the problem is you have to be very careful with not leaking the keys. Uh, the first way that the attacker can actually leak the keys is if they find a file disclosure vulnerability in your application, like for example, an XXE vulnerability. Um, also, there may be some vulnerabilities in the framework like in 2010 and 15 that allow the attackers to actually leak those keys. From Troy's uh, side, um, you may recognize this, Apparently, you can actually leak the validation key and the encryption key if you are not using custom errors, at least in the past. Uh, also, I found like hundreds of uh, validation and encryption keys in GitHub. So if you are going to install something like a CMS or a block just by you know, cloning the repo from, um, from GitHub and then installing that, be very careful and always generate new keys. Never use the ones that are provided by these kind of projects. Same thing with uh, one-click installers. Do you get the latest version of this whatever CMS or whatever uh, block application and then you install it and some of them will use static keys that they won't generate per installation. In those cases, the attacker will be able to install the same uh, CMS, for, for example, and then um, you know, no, leak the, the keys and then attack and get arbitrary code execution in your CMS block application or whatever. So be very, very careful with leaking the key. Uh, a good advice is to encrypt some sections of your web config file. So you can actually ask IIS to encrypt this section. So if you get like um, XXE vulnerability or a file disclosure vulnerability, at least they won't be able to leak those keys. So signing is okay if the client doesn't need to modify the data. So that's, that's, that's okay. But what if this is a pure like client server that are sending like arbitrary messages, then you cannot sign the, the data because in that case, the client needs to have the signature keys, uh, the validation keys, which if the attacker is in control of the client, it makes no sense. So this, in this case, uh, what you have to do is actually bind it, right? Uh, this is... Uh, very simple, it's very similar to the concept of the look ahead deserialization in Java. So basically, right before instantiating those types that are controlled by the attacker, just stop for a while and ask yourself if you want to really deserialize this, uh, this assembly name and this type name, right? So you are provided with uh, this uh, assembly name and type name, and you can stop and apply a whitelist or a blacklist and then decide if you want to continue with the deserialization or stop, right? So this is uh, done by implementing the serialization binder interface. This is a good example by Jonathan Birch from Microsoft. Um, basically just implement this interface and then um, prepare like a list of allowed types 
with the type names that you are going to allow, and then a preloaded uh, instance of those types. This will be important. I will show you why later. Then just implement the override the bind to type, and then check if the uh, type that the attacker is sending is, is uh, within the whitelist of allowed types. And if that's the case, then continue and return the preloaded type. Otherwise, just throw an exception and abort the, um, the, the deserialization. So then you have to uh, actually instantiate the serialization binder, assign it to the binder property, and deserialize. Right? Easy. So while I was reviewing some Microsoft product, I found one of them being vulnerable to uh, remote code execution uh, through deserialization. And they had something, they had a, a deserialization binder in place. So it was like, okay, they are caring about this. But then I realized that the serialization binder was not that secure as they thought, for example. So this is not the actual Microsoft code, um, but this is something that I put together in order to re reproduce more or less what they were doing. So I'm still in the process of disclosing this vulnerability and haven't been fixed. So at some point, what they were doing is uh, they were checking if the namespace starts with Microsoft dot put the name of a very popular Microsoft product here. And if that's the case, then load the um, type and return it. Otherwise, return null. So there are multiple vulnerabilities here. First of all, if you return null, it may not do what you may think that it's doing. It's not going to abort the deserialization. It's going to fall back to the default binder, which will bind anything, which will bind including the remote code execution gadget type, so it's not, I, not protecting anything. So the second problem here is that uh, loading the type using reflection at deserialization time is very costly. And actually, this will lead to DOS. The attacker can easily DOS your application because you are not using preloaded types. If you remember the good example from, from Jonathan, he was actually preloading the types here and then just returning them in, in the method that gets executed during the deserialization. And the third problem here is that this space, this namespace here, is just huge. It contains like thousands of, of, of types, right? So, even if the attacker cannot find a remote code execution gadget within this Microsoft dot something uh, namespace, they will be able, probably chances are that they uh, will be able to find what is known as a bypass gadget. And what is a bypass gadget? It's just a gadget, so it starts with a deserialization callback, and at some point, instead of running arbitrary code, for example, or doing bad things, they just run a nested deserialization operation. The problem here is that even though you are protecting your uh, outer deserialization operation, the inner one, the one that is run by this uh, bypass gadget, has no binder in it, right? You have, it's instantiated uh, here, and then just deserializing, there is no binder assignment. So that means that this uh, deserialization operation will let all the remote code execution gadget types to be um, processed and deserialized and, and the payloads to be executed. So yeah, this is basically sum up what I was talking you about. Never return null because uh, this will fall back to the default binder, and that's bad. Uh, also, don't use um, reflection to load types at runtime because that will DOS your application. And the fourth approach is to replace it, right? So we saw the first one is uh, stop using it if you don't need it. The second one, if the client doesn't need to change the data, then sign it and verify that. Third approach is if the client needs to actually send you data, then use a binder to control what types get deserialized. And the fourth approach is if the architecture of your application allows you to do that, um, change uh, these formats that include the type discriminators, the type information, change that with something else. And a good alternative here is Google protocol buffers where you agree, the client and the server agree in what they are going to exchange and then they exchange just the data. So if they are going to exchange an instance of a com.acme.user, then they will agree, they will know in advance that they are going to exchange that, and then they will just share the name of the user, the last name of the user, the address of the user, but no type information, no property type names, or nothing like that. And also, if you don't really need the type information, like we said before, just don't use it, and that will make those JSON and XML serializers to be safe, at least from this kind of attacks. So with that, um, mahalo. And if you have any questions, I think we have time, right, to take questions? Jim? Yeah.
Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's this approach and and basically the only cases where you really need to include type information that I can think of is if you are dealing with poly, for, for example uh, polymorphism types where you may send, I don't know, an instance of an animal, but that may, you need the information to need, to, to know if you need to reconstruct a dog or a cat, for example. So you need to send the information, the type information with that. And that's the whole purpose of all these uh, time name handling things, uh, the JSON, JavaScript uh, script serializer, uh, these uh, simple type resolver and so on. So those are meant to deal with some of the object, object oriented programming features like polymorphism, uh, generics, and so on. So if you, you should be only be sending things like DTOs and, and POJOs, right? Something very simple. If you find yourself that you require things like polymorphism, then maybe you need to rethink uh, what you're sending. So. Jim? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Ask Rick. <laughs> there you go. I love this slide. <laughs> so I will just put it again. <laughs> so yeah, this is the, um, the whole design flow in deserialization is that they allow you to change the type discriminators. And if that happens, then attackers can arbitrarily instantiate any type, and that's the big problem here. Any questions? All right, so thank you. <laughs>